here. And I am pleased to introduce our webinar leader today, that is Todd Pattison. He is conservator for the New England Historical, Historic Genealogical Society. Previously, he worked as a book conservator at the Northeast Document Conservation Center and was the con collections conservator at Harvard College Library, supervising a lab treating Harvard's general collections. Todd first became fascinating with fascinated with the binding of books in the Boy Scouts while completing his book binding merit badge. He is an active member of the New England chapter of Book Workers and a fellow in the American Institute for Conservation. And he also teaches American publishers bindings 1800 to 1900 for Rare Book School in Charlottesville, Virginia. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Todd and thank you so much for leading today's webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron, and uh, thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time with um, this one particular book, Six Months in a Convent. But before we um, really kind of delve into that, we need a little bit of, of, of backstory, a little bit of, of um, history here. And I'm having a problem. Oh, sorry. Just a problem getting my first slide. So when the publisher Thomas Crowell, um, who was a bookbinder at the time that this uh, advertising card came out, transferred the bookbinding business from Boston to New York in 1900, a one-page article in Publishers Weekly covered the move and reviewed the company's history. Now, the firm was originally started as a book bindery set up by Benjamin Bradley in 1832, although you'll notice at the top of the card it says established 1834, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. And the article stated that, quote, Mr. Bradley's first profitable stroke was his work upon the covers of Six Months in a Convent, a volume which had a remarkable sale for its day, end quote. Now, there are very few details about the business as a whole, in the article, there was no other book title mentioned. So it seems remarkable that a book that was bound 65 years ago, 20 years almost before uh, Kroll had entered Bradley's business, um, he took over the business with Bradley's widow for five years uh, in the 1860s and then became sole proprietor, um, that that one book is the one that they mentioned. So that piqued my interest in it. And um, hopefully after we go through the webinar today, um, your interest will be piqued as well. Now, Bradley goes on to become uh, the largest bookbinder. He runs the largest bookbinding establishment in New England. Uh, his worth was estimated to be $100,000 in 1852. This is from the rich men of Massachusetts. Um, it's not the most flattering uh, description um, since it's basically saying he can't be ranked among our most distinguished literary men. He grew up on a farm in, in Haverhill, Massachusetts, one of a number of children and uh, went to do an apprenticeship in um, Concord, New Hampshire. Um, so he was really a self-made man. And it does seem that um, maybe this one book didn't totally make his fortune, but uh, Six Months in a Convent um, was such a remarkable book for him for binding this. He didn't print it. He didn't publish it. Um, he just did the binding that um, we're going to really try to analyze it today. So uh, a little bit of background. When um, the 19th century started, this was kind of your typical binding that you would have. This is a, a book from 1805. It's uh, leather bound, it's calf leather, it has um, a little bit of staining to the leather, it has gold lines on the spine, and it has a black leather label that's tooled in gold with the title. Fast forward 50 years, and this is uh, maybe not your typical binding, but you know this is certainly has the characteristics of bindings that you would find from the mid 1850s. So this is exactly uh, 50 years later, 1855. This is cloth. It's not leather. It's gold stamped. It's not gold tooled. So they did this with a machine. They didn't do it with uh, a hand tool. Um, 
and a workman, you know, repeating that hand tool a number of times. Um, it's also a case binding, where the binding before would be an in boards binding, meaning that they attach the boards prior to covering the book. And case binding uh, means that the cover is made separately from the text block, so it can be stamped with a, a machine and, and can be really manipulated very differently. And then as a final step, the two are put together. And we'll talk just a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the other thing that you'll notice here, we don't really have the title of the book. Um, the title of the book almost seems kind of secondary. It, it's not really important for selling the book. Um, you know, Tupper might have been uh, very popular at the time. He certainly was more popular then than he is today. Um, the name Tupper certainly fits the design of the book much better than proverbial philosophy, the title would. And the design itself is an overall design. It moves from the back cover across the spine onto the front cover, uh, something that's foreshadowing the um, designs that, that you would see from the end of the 19th century. It's a little bit unusual here, um, but certainly this binding um, has very little in common with the book that we saw earlier. Probably the, the only major thing that it has in common is that it would have had the printed pages folded by hand, gathered by hand, and sewn by hand. And then once you get beyond that, um, there's kind of very little uh, crossover between the two. So how did they get from here to there? Well, we're gonna look more closely at Bradley and his business and how this one book seemed to really, maybe not shape his business totally, um, but it, it really shows what's happening in the 1830s when bookbinding is moving from one type of binding to another type of binding. So this is a, uh, a ticket for the bindery of Whitney and Bradley. So Whitney was employed in um, the same Concord, New Hampshire bindery that Bradley was. He was basically Bradley's foreman and they both moved to Boston together and set up a bindery in 1828 uh, when Bradley was about 26 years old. Um, they were on Washington Street, 164 Washington Street, which was a major center for book production, both printers, publishers, booksellers, and binders. And you would guess that this partnership, you know, would do well, and it wouldn't be Bradley that we would be talking about in 1835 with a profitable stroke. It would be Whitney. But sometime in 1831, um, or possibly early 1832, they split up. Bradley stays at the 164 Washington Street and Whitney goes and partners with another bookbinder. And basically within five years, he's out of bookbinding totally. So either there was, um, some people figure that there was a disagreement in the kind of binding that they were gonna do or how they were gonna approach binding. Uh, bookbinders tend to be fairly um, stubborn um, in terms of how they like to practice their, their craft, um, or maybe something else was going on. But in any way, Bradley stays at 164, somehow buys out Whitney, and um, he continues to work on this set of 54 volumes of the Waverly novels that was put out by Samuel Parker um, in Boston. And so this is uh, number 43, uh, I chose this for a reason that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but this is the kind of binding that they were doing. And this is a typical binding from the late 1820s, early 1830s. So it's full cloth. It has a paper label. Um, it doesn't have a stamped gold title to it. There's no decoration on the boards. Um, and this is volume 43, which was issued in 1833. So Parker is putting out um, a number of volumes each year, starting in 1830. And by 1833, he's gotten up to volume 43. In 1833, um, November 4th to be exact, the building at 164 where Benjamin Bradley has his book bindery uh, burns to the ground. Coincidentally, Samuel Parker had his shop on the first floor of that building. Bradley was on the second floor along with a music publisher. 
and then the upper floors of the building were Mr. Parker's printing office. Um, I'm highlighting this, and again, it's a horrible copy from a, a digitized newspaper, because at the, uh, the, the lower section that I have marked off of where it says, we are happy to learn, however, that none of the valuable stereotype plates of the Waverly novels were lost, except a one or two novel uh, works which were in the process of being printed. That's very important because having the stereotype plates means um, that Parker, at least, can you know, start printing again. Um, Bradley, unfortunately, had uh, about a $2,000 loss and he had insurance only for $500. Uh, so he lost a considerable sum of money. Um, he doesn't have a place. He doesn't have any equipment. He doesn't have any materials. And this is less than 18 months before six months in a convent um, is issued and, and Bradley finds his profitable stroke. Now I showed uh, volume 43 because that contained a prospectus for um, additional Sir, Sir Walter Scott's works. And so it tells us about the Waverly novels that Bradley was binding. Um, it gives the, you know, the size, the paper, the printing will be the same for this new prospectus, this, these new poetic, poetical works of Sir Walter Scott. And it says that the Waverly novels, the ones that Bradley are binding, are done up in cloth, price 62 and a half cents each volume. So we know, you know, obviously we know they're done in cloth because we see them, but we also get a price to it. And we get further information down at the bottom here in that there's a two volume in one edition uh, on a second quality paper. So the paper's not as good. There's no engraving. Um, a frontispiece, which all the Waverly novels had. And that is 75 cents, again, for the two volumes. So it's uh, a little bit smaller in size because the, the paper's a little bit smaller. And what that tells us is that Parker was using those stereotype plates to put out another edition. Um, bibliographically, it's very confusing because here we see volume 37 title page for the single volume set and the volume 37 title page for the two volumes bound is one. And they, um, they did a new title page for that primarily because the date changed because the two volume set was started after the one volume set. They never did catch up. And so volume 37 of the single volume set came out in 1833. Volume 37 of the two volumes bound is one came out in 1834. To a bibliographer, this looks like two different books, and it actually is two different types of books, but it's a little confusing when you start to talk about the Waverly novels put out by Parker um, can be different times, different years, based upon whether they're part of one set or another set. Um, this is volume 46 on the left, volume 47 on the right, and these two volumes happen on each side of the fire. So volume 46 is put out before the fire happens in, again, November 1833. Volume 47 is the next volume that comes out after that change. And you can see from a binding standpoint, they're identical. Um, what changes is uh, Parker's address because Parker is no longer at 164 Washington Street because that building's destroyed. Now he puts just Washington Street as a generic address. Um, probably because he, he doesn't really know where he's going to land. He can take his stereotype plates and uh, have another printer print them for him so that he can continue publication and can continue to bring in money. Um, but he doesn't have a physical location yet. So this is the breaking point in between when the fire happens, um, interrupting the, the publication for just a short time period. Now this is volume 53. It's the second to last volume. Again, it looks identical with the others. The, the binding was carried on uh, the, the same way. Uh, I can't prove that Bradley did the binding, but I see no reason why Parker would have chosen someone else to do the binding. And, and certainly Bradley continued to be a book binder. And so it would make a lot of sense that they had a relationship before the fire and they would continue this relationship. What's interesting about this volume is the back pace down uh, is lifted, and so we get to see the construction. So this is a cloth 
covered volume, but it's not a cloth case volume. So this is an inboards binding, the same way that the town officer we saw uh, earlier covered in leather is, although probably the means of attaching the boards is different. Here, the arrow is pointing to a partially torn um, sheet that was uh, part of the, the end sheet construction that was used to attach the board. So that gets pasted out, the board gets stuck down, the sewing supports get captured in between that, they're not laced into the board at all, and that covers it uh, in terms of attaching the boards. Now, when the volume is covered, we can see the arrow is now pointing to the cloth turn-in, which goes over that attaching leaf. So the construction of this is the same as the, the binding from 1805 that we saw, meaning that not much has really changed in Bradley's business except the covering material and how the title is done. Now, this is a little awkward to try to cover. So this is a model of um, this particular binding, and you can see the uh, attaching uh, leaf needs to be split at the head and tail of the spine um, so that you can do the turn-ins of the boards and you have to kind of hold the boards away from the text block as you're turning in that cloth. And it, it tends to be a, a fairly you know, limp cloth at that time because it's got adhesive on it. They would sometimes, in fact, they did with the Waverly novels, they lined that with a piece of paper. You can sometimes see the edges, a, a shadow of the edge, just to stiffen it up to help them turn that in. So this is the technology that Bradley's using still in 1834. Um, and this is how, in the early 30s, people could title cloth-bound books or decorate cloth-bound books. They could do something to the cloth itself, um, you know, give it a grain, give it a pattern, something like that. They could use a paper label, which you see a very um, unusual paper label here. And they could also print um, cloth the same way that they would print paper. Again, this is a more unusual printed cloth volume. It's a children's book put out by Harper's in 1833, part of a, you know, one of their library series. And so they've included an illustration on the front cover probably to, you know, appeal to children so that they would, you know, bug their parents to buy this book for them. Uh, this is also a very typical binding from the late 1820s and the early 1830s, and it's a quarter cloth and paper binding with, again, a paper label. Uh, you do sometimes see leather labels uh, because they could, you know, put the leather patch on and tool it the same way they would on a, a leather-bound book but you see more of the paper labels because they're just so easy to print and, and adhere. So this is a Philadelphia binding from 1832, just to show that regionally, um, you would see the same thing being put out in, in New York as well. Um, they have a very kind of consistent ability to decorate uh, cloth bindings. So six months in a convent uh, starts to be advertised uh, on March 3rd, 1835, that it's going to be coming out very shortly. Um, they say a few days. It, it actually gets published March 17th. Um, they say that the book is going to be about 200 pages. It ends up being 192 pages. It's an 18 mo, and they're calling it finished and bound in the neatest manner. <clears throat> and so on the left, we see Six Months in a Convent. On the right, we see the, again, our volume 53 of the Waverly novels, and they, they look very different. Um, we don't have a paper label. We have gold stamping directly onto cloth. Uh, we also have stamping on the boards. It's a blind stamp, um, but still it's added decoration. It's, it's making the book look a lot better. It is a, a major step forward. Now, at the same time that Bradley's binding this in mid-March of 1835, he's finishing up the two-volume Bound is One Waverly novel set, which looks very, very similar to the, the single-volume set. The cloth is very similar. They use a paper label. The paper label is uh, much square because you have two volumes bound together. Uh, but this, you know, volume 30, 53, 
from the single volume set kind of stands in for that. So he's doing these at the same time um, where he's using this very new technology on the left, this very kind of previous decade technology on the right. What's really interesting about the spine stamping is we have a pictorial um, brass die being used uh, to stamp in gold, which um, is one of the earliest uh, pictorial dies uh, that was used in Boston. And to me, at least in my experience, this is the earliest depiction of an actual subject matter. So this isn't just a generic building. This is the Charlestown nunnery. Um, and we can see in a, a, a woodcut from uh, just after the fire in August 1834 when the, the convent was burned down. I should have probably given you a little bit more idea of you know, what the book is about, and we'll get into that in just a second. But you can see that the um, kind of cupola on top is the same. The staircase that goes up to the second floor as opposed to the first floor is the same. Those chimneys on either end. Uh, the only thing that we're really missing, and it's probably because of the linear nature of the spine, are the two um, parts of the building uh, on either side that are cut out. But otherwise, this was meant to be an actual representation of that Charleston nunnery. <clears throat> now, when Six Months in a Convent was put out, um, there was a lot of interest in the story. Uh, again, the fire happens, it was destroyed in uh, August 1834, some people call it the kind of the first act of the anti-Catholic know-nothings, uh, the political movement in America. Uh, and here we see two different publications about um, the trial on the right and the, the conflagration of the Ursuline convent on the left. So the story that was circulating before this time uh, was that Rebecca Reed was held kind of as a prisoner in the convent for six months, um, hence the title of the book, and that she wasn't really allowed to escape. Um, and she was treated very poorly, which whipped up this um, anti-Catholic um, Protestant uh, fervor that finally led, you know, supposedly on a, a drunken night in the middle of summer into them burning the convent down. And so by the time Six Months comes out, which is basically Rebecca Reed telling her story, um, trying to defend herself because the burning of the convent was an, was an awful thing, uh, a, a terrible thing. No lives were really lost because they warned the nuns in the building to, to escape. But still, it was a huge property damage. Um, so there was a lot of interest in this. So they stereotyped the text immediately. And that means that they took special type and they set it up with the text and then made uh, metal plates, very thin metal plates from that set type. They could then redistribute the type, you know, use it again, and they would have a printing plate that they could print anytime they wanted with, which, um, again, was, was thin so that it was easier to store, it wasn't as heavy, and it showed that they expected demand for this. It had a, yeah, an initial print run of 5,000 copies, which was a pretty large print run, but they expected to sell more than that. Um, so it's significant that they stereotyped this, at least to me and the way I'm looking at the binding, it's very significant that they stereotyped it right from the beginning. So, <clears throat> There was incredible demand for um, six months, you know, initially. They printed more than 50,000 copies before the fall of that year, which is a huge amount of books to sell at the time. Every one of those copies was bound by Benjamin Bradley, you know, by his bindery. You know, he wasn't really binding them all. He, he owned a bindery, and we'll talk about how many people he had working for him during that time period. There are four different bindings that appear on Six Months in a Convent. Again, this is all in a very short time period. And so I've always wondered, you know, with that quote from the Publishers Weekly in, in 1900, that it was such a profitable stroke, why were there four different bindings? And 
you know, how could you figure out which one comes first? You know, which one comes later? Are they all just jumbled together? Um, I have a lot of questions or had a lot of questions about the binding um, because it was, you know, s mentioned so prominently uh, 65 years later. So I wanted to set out to see if I could answer those two questions. Why did he use different bindings? And how can we determine the order of those bindings? And if we can answer those questions, what does it tell us about Bradley's business? So here are the four different bindings. Um, the one that I've shown before is the one on the right, and that's probably 90% of the, the copies that you'll see will be in that binding if they're in an original binding. And then there are three other ones. Three of them are signed. Um, the third one from the left is not signed. It's very hard to see um, the signatures on any of these. So I've kind of blown the signatures up a little bit. And in the case of the one on the left, the liar, I've actually used a different version that was stamped in gold. Uh, the, the six months in the convent was never stamped in gold on the boards, at least none that I've seen. So that's from a different book, but it just allows you to see the stamp better. So hopefully you'll be able to see the Bradley name in the three that are signed. And then of course, the one without a signature, it's, it's just smooth there, it's plain. So I wanted to figure out, you know, why was he using what binding? When was he doing it? What are the order of them? And what would that tell me about his business? So I'm very, very curious about this brass die that was used to stamp both of these books. It seems like it's the same die. I've done a lot of measurements of it. Um, they all match up, but some copies don't have a signature and then most of the copies do have a signature. So, so what's going on there? Um, so that's another kind of question about all this. Now, like almost every other book, it seems like from the 19th centuries, uh, six months has been digitized. Uh, it's been digitized at least five times. Um, this is the metadata from one of those copies. And it doesn't say anything about the binding. So by looking at digital copies, um, you're really limited in terms of what you can learn from the binding uh, in that. Fortunately, because they put out more than 50,000 copies of this, and it's not quite as in demand today as it was then, I've been able to purchase a number of copies. So I have more than 42 copies now, which allows me to look at the physical books themselves and compare one to the other, which I think is extremely important. Um, and so what can, we, what can we learn from six months in a convent? Well, it was so popular that they ran a few newspaper ads about it, or actually stories about it, not ads really, um, just talking about the demand and how they can't keep up with demand. Um, they just can't make enough. And so I'm highlighting here, 40 persons are employed in folding and binding. And in this way, they're able to issue from 10 to 1300 a day. So more than 5,000 bindings a day, Bradley is able to put out. And this is less than a month after six months was first issued. And they've already um, put out more than 25,000 volumes. So it's a tremendous workload for the bindery. And they're actually doing it just with 40 people, which seems a little surprising to me uh, at the time period, but we'll talk about how they're able to, to do that. So the first printing was 5,000 copies. So I just wanted to talk about how much work that actually is. So it was 192 pages. Uh, it was printed in 16 signatures. It was actually printed in eight sheets. Um, it was printed uh, as a 24-page uh, a signature and a 12-page signature. Um, and so they would first need to cut those sheets to get the two signatures. Uh, and then they would have to do 200,000 folds to the printed sheets uh, to come up with the folded signatures. And then they would have to gather 80,000 signatures and then so 90,000 signatures if you count the end sheets as additional signatures, um, which they were sewn just like the rest of the signatures. So I, I think of them as a signature in a way. They're just not a printed signature. Tremendous amounts of work. And then you have five 
thousand text blocks to forward, 5,000 bindings to make, and then 5,000 bindings to decorate, which means the front board, the back board, and the spine all require different decoration. Um, at least it can't be done at the same time. It has to be done at different times. So this is all less than a week with 40 people. So one of the things that they're doing is they're making case bindings as opposed to the inboards, what I call adhered board bindings, where the boards were attached with a leaf or a stub of a leaf of the end sheet construction prior to covering. So here we have the text block on the right, which has been sewn, and I've put an arrow at one of the sewing supports. Um, the other one is down at the bottom, and you can kind of see just a little bit of peeking out uh, underneath the spine lining, which I've also highlighted with an arrow there. So the text block is folded, it's gathered, it's sewn, it's forwarded with this spine lining, it's rounded. The sewing sports get kind of captured between the spine lining and the pace down. Then the case is on the, the left. You can see the rest of the case the, is underneath the text block. So it's ready to be cased in. You place the text block on the case, you apply adhesive to the paste down, and then you simply close the board over the top. And that's after the decoration is done on the book. So it's kind of this idea of interchangeable parts. They can make 5,000 text blocks, all the same size, 5,000 cases, all the same size, and any case fits any text block. And so that's one way that they're able to move quicker on binding this book than if they were in boards bindings. They can also organize their labor differently and they can hire more women, um, which is a whole other story to do all of the folding, uh, gathering and sewing. And it, it's even possible at that time period in 1835 that Bradley had a majority female bindery. Um, although I, I can't prove that at all. So, <laughs> I looked at the bindings from the standpoint of the stereotype plates because I started to notice that there was damage to the printing. And I had to figure out, um, you know, initially, is that, you know, just poorly printed? Is it damaged to the stereotype plate? Uh, and the other thing I also want to mention uh, is that. Uh, this talk is in part based on an article that I uh, wrote with Ariel Middleman from the Library Company of Philadelphia. Uh, and she was really instrumental in a lot of uh, this examination of these stereotype plates, comparing copies with each other. The library company has a you know, fantastic collection uh, and they have quite a number of six months in a, cop, uh, in a convent. Uh, that they can compare. So I'm calling this stereotype plate changes damage. Almost everything that we looked at together was damage except for this change on the title page. So that was the other thing that was curious to me is that you have two different New York publishers in these books. And so which one comes first? You know, was it Levitt Lord and Company or Nelson Hall um, on John Street? The date is exactly the same. All of these bindings were put out in 1836. I've never seen a, 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 you know, a copy that goes into 1830, 1835, they're all put out. I've never seen one in 1836. So it, it seems like the demand finally was met sometime in the fall and then it's over. So this was the first um, kind of change that we noted. Um, and so if a, a binding had one publisher, we would check that. If it had another publisher, we wouldn't check that it wouldn't be a point of change. And we looked at 34 um, different points where the stereotype plates were uh, changed by being damaged. And uh, you know, fortunately for you, I'm not going to show you all 34, but I wanna show you some to, to look at the kinds of damage that we were looking at. There, there certainly is more damage in the books than, than those 34, but the, there were 34 that seemed to be um, significant, at least in terms of ordering the, the, the printings and the bindings. So on page 34, this from gets damaged at some point uh, where the O is. And then from then on, it always looks the same. 
So it's either before the damage or it's after the damage. Uh, page 46, got this long scratch in the plate, um, kind of the lower right-hand corner of that pointed out by the arrow. And scratches were a common thing that happened. You know, maybe they were taking it off the press or putting it on the press and they just caught something, some other metal, which uh, damaged it. Um, this one particular point of damage in inhabitant is in every single copy. We've never found a copy that did not have this damage. Um, so this is kind of in the plate when they made it. Uh, and that could happen with some air getting in there, um, you know, because it's being cast. And so you, you could have a problem with the casting of the plate originally. So every copy we've noticed has at least one point of damage. Um, some seem so glaring that you would think someone would have noticed, you know, page 55 just all of a sudden disappears in the plates, the stereotype plates, and then you don't have a 55 anymore. Here, um, the, the last part of the two sentences uh, on this particular page, it's, it's, it's at the notes in the bottom of the page, just disappear at some point. I, it, it seems almost um, as if they were removed for some particular reason because it's so cleanly done. You know, there's no damage to anything else around it. But it, at some point, this was removed from the plate for whatever reason and you don't, you don't see it printed anymore. Um, here's another spot in the notes where uh, it gets uh, damaged down at the bottom, and this is page 90. Page 127, the page number starts to have a problem at some point. Um, and then the sixth in six months on the top of page 182, the header uh, gets damaged. Um, you know, the O, in the months part also is damaged, but you know we had to pick and choose what part we were gonna look at on these. And then page 187, again, a, a very big long scratch, which if you just see this once, you might think, oh, the, maybe the page was folded over when they printed and then it got unfolded. But um, when you start to see it over and over again, you realize that it's some kind of damage. And then finally, the last point that we'll look at, um, the, the Pope is missing. Uh, in the, the bottom copy of this, uh, there's some other damage over on the right-hand side. Um, and so those are some of the 34 specific types of damage that we looked at. Now, you'll notice in the top of this, it appears that there is damage um, up here on the, the left-hand side, and that's just poorly inked. Um, it really isn't damage. Um, they just didn't ink the page very well, and so that doesn't show up. So sometimes you have to figure out what is, what's damage that's in the plates and what is just a problem from the printing. Now there was one other thing that separated certain copies of Six Months in a Convent, and that is yellow ads that the publisher put out um, that were bound in the back of, of very few copies. But some copies do have these yellow ads. Uh, I believe that they had printed up a number of them, they bound the ones in, and then once they were done with those, then they didn't have any more to bind in, and so that's why they only appear in, in some of the copies. So these aren't books that were all published by Russell, Odeorn, and company. Um, they were, you know, booksellers. They had a stock of miscellaneous books, they say. Um, it's actually 16 pages, and it's kind of interesting in its own right because it shows you the different types of bindings that were on books at this time. So uh, in just this small little part of one of the pages, you can see two books that are cloth bound marked with the arrows, and then three books that are bound in sheep, two more books that are in boards, which would be a stiff paper binding. Um, and then at the very bottom lower right hand corner, there's a book that's half bound, which would be Kind of a quarter leather and paper binding. Um, that's just what that meant at the time, the terminology half bound. It wasn't just halfway bound, it was a quarter leather binding, usually very cheap binding. Um, and you can see that, you know, they're selling it for 37 cents, even though originally it was a dollar.
So the, the ads are significant as well, I think. So if, if we just look at this stereotype plate damage in uh, the first 14 copies I was able to acquire, you can see the number of mistakes ranges from a low of one, which is the mistake that we've seen in every single copy, to a high of 30 um, just within these 14 copies. And you'll also notice that two of the copies have the yellow ads. So we're gonna specifically uh, take a little bit of a look at these three that are marked in red now. Two of them have the ads, uh, and the one at the bottom does not have the ads, but it also has a very small number of mistakes, basically one more mistake than you would have as a baseline. So if we look at um, SM108, um, which has just one mistake, uh, we can see that it's in this binding with the liar. It has a different uh, stamp around the, the outside cover, and this has the ads. So this was one of the first bindings that was put out. And that's why I'm led to believe that they had, I don't know, maybe 500 copies of the, the yellow ads and they bound those in and once the, they were gone, they were gone. Um, this is SM109. It has the basket with the signature on it. Uh, it has a very strong cloth grain too, which uh, it's, it's difficult to photograph, but hopefully you can see that basket. Um, this has one additional mistake, so it has two mistakes, and it has the yellow ads again. And then if we look at the final book from this small group with um, two mistakes or less, uh, SM114, we can notice that this, if you look down at the bottom of the stamping on the boards, does not have a signature. So this now allows us to kind of order, even with a small group of books, to order these bindings. And this is a close up so you can see the signature just isn't there. You know, sometimes copies are um, in poor condition and so you, you don't necessarily know if the signature just can't be seen, but you know, that's pretty clear that there's nothing in that stamped area. So this allows us to order the bindings. Um, and we can see that the later binding on the right, the one that we see 90% of the time, um, always has more than four points of damage in it. You're, you're never going to find that binding on uh, a text block that only has one or two points of damage. Uh, and if I had to order the other three, which I think it's very difficult to do because they, it seems like they were doing the first 5,000 with a combination of these three bindings, I would probably put them in the order that they're in now, but I don't think you can get to that level at least without seeing more than the number of books that we've seen so far. Now this SM103, which is again, one of this small subgroup of the first 14 I got, has a very interesting, unusual cloth in it. It also has 26 mistakes. So this is later in the production run uh, because we're only looking at 34 points of damage. So um, this has a lot of damage and as you get later on, the damage isn't always consistent uh, because it appears that they were printing signatures furiously and then gathering them together. And so you might get a signature from a slightly earlier printing gathered into a text block that was mostly a slightly later printing. So that it does get a little bit muddied, but 26 mistakes is a lot of mistakes. So Bradley, for some reason, decides to use a, you know, this expensive type of ribbon embossed cloth. and um, Andrea Krupp, who's done a you know, fantastic uh, cloth grain uh, book, uh, calls this FS7. Um, and she has only seen it in 1835, 1836, and four times. Um, so it's a fairly uh, rare cloth, and it's a, you know, an interesting cloth. And it shows Bradley looking at trying to use more interesting covering materials in terms of the cloth even at this early um, at this early date in 1835. Now just to show you a few other elements of production, um, the text blocks weren't always trimmed that carefully. Um, they were just trimmed enough to square them up kind of like a, a boarded binding. Um, this you know earlier practice of binding books in a, a stiff paper binding um, and so you can see it, the, the bottom edge, uh, we, 
we see the edge of the folded sheets in some places where it's not cut off. We also get this good indication of how quickly they were working and how it seems like the binding part might have lagged the, the forwarding of the text block. Remember the text blocks are being made separately, the bindings are being made separately, and then at the end they're put together. And so this text block got damaged somehow where this corner of the, the text block, the lower right-hand corner, um, you know, got gouged, got ripped, got torn. And when they went to case it in, we actually can see the board underneath. Um, it's, not, it's not covering that area up. And so this is telling you that this damage is happening before they case the book in. And I have another example of that here um, where the arrow down at the bottom of the screen is pointing to the damage of the text block. And then the arrow that's um, kind of midway up the screen on the right-hand side, you again can see part of that board underneath. So this text block was damaged before they went and cased it in. Obviously a lot of damage can happen to a book after, you know, in the, in the next 185 years until today. Um, so this copy has, you know, gotten some damage from use, wear, time, but also you can see the wrinkles in the cloth where they were um, working with a, you know, a fairly newer material and sometimes it just didn't work the way they wanted to. And so this has wrinkles that over time then got torn. So the detail that you're seeing there, you can kind of see the backside of the, of the cloth where it's gotten torn. So again, they're working very quickly trying to put out, you know, in some cases, 1300 bindings in a day, just 40 people. <clears throat> and this is my favorite um, copy. This is at the Library of Congress. It was the, the copy that they, they put in for copyright, um, which is the little pencil D below 1835 on the title page. And you can see this was stamped twice. So it got stamped originally with that blind stamp on the board. And then um, for whatever reason, uh, it got stamped a second time after the case had shifted. Maybe someone wasn't paying attention to what they were doing. Maybe they're worried about getting their fingers caught in the the stamping press as they were using it. Um, but I, I just love that it has that damage to it. And then it actually did get digitized. And so we can see that damage. Um, it, it's available in Hathi Trust. So just looking at the damage from the digital copies, um, and I've kind of shortened this down so that you see errors one through three and then 30 through uh, 34, um, you can see quite a range. So there are two copies from the New York Public Library. One has two points of damage, one has four points of damage. Um, unfortunately for neither of those do we see a binding at all. So I have an arrow pointing to the um, not available part. So we don't know if they're signed, we don't know the grain of the cloth, we don't know what dye they would have used to stamp it with um, or how the corners would have been done. And we can see that they both have the same publisher. So they have Levitt as the publisher, as opposed to Nelson Hall. So Levitt was the first publisher, and then at some point they co-publisher, the New York publisher, and they were kind of erased from the stereotype plate and Nelson Hall was, was put in. So the stereotype plate damage answers that question for us as well about the, you know, which publisher came first. So it's called the profitable stroke. How much money did Bradley make off of it? We don't really know. There's no records of that. But we have this book, which is a very similar binding um, done for William D. Tickner. We don't know if Bradley did it. It's not signed. Um, there's no way to, to really tie it to Bradley, but it's a possibility that he did do it. It looks very similar to Six Months in a Convent and that we have a cloth binding with the boards stamped with an overall die and blind, and then a pictorial stamped um, part of the title. And because it's from Tickner and Fields, uh, and we uh, have the cost book still extant for them for this time period, we can see exactly how much this binding cost, 11 cents. Um, and I think that's a pretty good range for six months in a convent. 
which means if Bradley was binding more than 50,000 of them, he made more than $5,000 just from this one binding alone um, in you know, five or six months. Uh, I just wanted to show you Philadelphia um, from the same time period. Um, I believe this book came out in May. Um, again, Carrie and Lee, we have cost books for them. So we know, you know how much this binding costs. I'm showing three copies just so that you know this is a very consistent binding. Um, it looks much more like the Waverly novels than it does six months. Uh, Philadelphia kind of lags a little bit in changing over to um, stamping on cases than Boston or New York does. And here, uh, the doing up or the binding and the price of the cloth comes out to $450 or nine cents per binding. So it's, again, it's in that range. Maybe we can look at the gold stamping and the blind stamping is costing an extra two cents. What's interesting about this is how much the cloth part of this charge is. So it's, it's one third of the cost of the binding. So it's an expensive material for them. It's, it's not like it's an incredibly cheap material compared to leather at this point in time. Now, besides um, six months in a convent, Bradley signed 17 other um, editions that year uh, for nine different publishers. He wasn't just working for one publisher, he was working for you know, basically anybody. So um, one of the 17 was the supplement to Six Months in a Convent where additional information was given. And then there's also a parody of Six Months in a Convent called Six Months in a House of Corrections that um, has basically the same binding um, as Six Months in a Convent except for the title. And here the title page, Six Months in a Convent on the left and its parody on the right, they're again trying for a very similar looking title page. Um, with somewhat similar language, even though it's a different publisher. Besides the three signed stamps that we've seen so far, Bradley used four other signed stamps in 1835 alone. So this one, I'm showing you a blow up so that you can see the signature a little. And here's another different blind stamp um, with the Bradley name in it. Here is the Third one, um, this is actually put on a book sideways. It's a large music book. Um, normally it's running uh, vertical as opposed to horizontal. So I've flipped it uh, 90 degrees so that you can see the, the name correctly. And then this is the last one, probably the most common um, signed stamp that Bradley used in the 1830s. Um, also was used in um, in 1835. So he kind of explodes with seven signed stamps in that one year. And most of the time, he's very careful in six months to have his name facing up. So we can see on the, the right hand board, the arrows pointing to, you know, B. Bradley Binder. Um, and on the left, it's also in the same orientation. So it's reading correctly which meant that he would have to change the stamping press in order to be able to do that, which he started to get away from later in the 1830s. Here on this book, The Stagecoach 1838, if you look at the signature on the backboard, um, and here's a close up, you can see the, the spine title, so we know it's the backboard. It's uh, at the top of the board and it's upside down. So it seems like having his name on it is still important in the 1830s, later, but in 1835, at least with six months with this kind of very early signing, maybe his first sign binding, he wants that name to be reading correctly and he's willing to take some extra time to do that. Which is something that the publisher does not seem to understand in the 1830s. So you've noticed none of the books that we've looked at have had the publisher's name on the outside of it. And in fact, some publishers seem to have done the opposite. So in this particular book, um, The Elements of Moral Science, uh, they've put the date on the bottom of the book and not just the year, but also the month, which to me would make this binding seem old in June because it would be dated the month before. So it's almost opposite of what you would wanna do. So Bradley is understanding marketing, getting his name out there, putting it prominently on the binding where Almost no publishers are noticing that in the 1830s. 
Now, in around 1840, he has to stop putting his name on the outside of the binding for whatever reason. He does stop, except for an almanac or another kind of advertising vehicle. So he uses an embossing either through the paste down or on the fly leaf. And these are six different embossings from Bradley's with the date range of when he used them. Some were very sh used for a very short time period, others for a little bit longer time period. He eventually transitions to tickets. And um, these are 16 different tickets that he used uh, in the late 1840s and 1850s. And there are even other places where Bradley's name appears here in the preface of a children's book that was printed in Philadelphia around 1850. Um, they've misspelled Bradley's name, but we know that it must be Benjamin Bradley, um, who was a man of taste. And I'm sure, you know, he tried to please you, but mostly he was trying to make money. Now, this seems like it would, um, you know, be a very American thing, but it's actually taken from the same book that was printed in London slightly earlier, a few years earlier, which was published by Tilt. And so Tilt's name is in the preface as opposed to Bradley's name. So I don't know how Bradley arranged to get his name in there or why someone did it, but they needed a different rhyme and they uh, used uh, Bradley in that. Now, <clears throat> As we progress on, and this is not a Bradley binding, but I just wanted to show you what happens um, after this initial introduction of gold in the in the mid 1830s. Gold starts to grow continuously on the cover, especially on the all important front cover in the spine, to where it almost fills it up. And sometimes they try to add any element that they can think of that might appeal to someone buying the the, the book. In this case, it's a children's book. So we'll put as many animals as we can on this children's book. And on the spine, we'll actually put the child on a pillar so that they'll want to buy this binding. And Bradley did experiment with some different kinds of cloth early on. Um, and here we see eight different copies of the sacred poems by Nathaniel Parker Willis um, that were put out by Clark and Austin between 1847 and 1850, just to show you how much they could do to decorate that book and to try to make it appealing to people. And this is kind of this time period where books are being sold on their cover by their covers in a way they never were before. And publishers are the ones that are selling them with the covers. It's not someone buying a book and saying, I want a fancy binding put on it. This is the binding that they're putting on it to try to attract you to want to purchase this book. And then this kind of goes on and on and on in the 19th century until you have this book in the early 20th century, which is very influenced by kind of the artist designers from the end of the, the century where they're designing books, they're true artists. Um, and here it's, you know, kind of a very um, stylized arts and crafts cover almost, but it's for standard American plumbing, uh, a book that you wouldn't think would sell based on its cover or that anyone who is purchasing it would care about the cover art on it. Um, you know, if you needed to know about plumbing, you would buy this book. Um, but here they've made, um, you know, this very kind of interesting artistic binding for, you know, even a book about plumbing. So I want to thank a few people, Aaron, um, the Bibliographical Society of America, uh, my co-author, Ariel Middleman from the Library Company of Philadelphia, although now uh, she's Ariel Rambo. I, I keep saying Middleman because that's on the article that I read. The American Antiquarian Society, um, who I've used some images from their collections, and of course, the New England Historic Genealogical Society, uh, where I work. So I'm going to stop my screen share now. And um, I think we still have some time for questions. Yeah, hi. Um, Todd, I'm just going to start your video now. Just a second. I can do it if you want, Aaron. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think it's going to ask you to. Um, so we do have 10 questions. Thanks, everybody, for upvoting. That is really helpful. Um, the first question is from John McMillan. He asks, were the American binders following European practices, or were there any aspects that are specifically American? Were there any unique aspects 
to 19th century American binding, or was it merely reflective of European bookbinding? Uh, certainly at the time period that Six Months came out, it was copying um, primarily English bookbinding. So the Waverly novels that um, Bradley was binding, they look very similar to Waverly novels that were being put out in um, Scotland at the time period. And even the construction of the bindings is very similar. So they had full cloth, paper labels, they were adhered boards where the boards were attached and then the, the cloth was covered. Um, America tended to be um, a little bit looser with what they would use as imagery for um, the covers of books. It had more of a folk art look to it almost in the 1830s and 1840s, where in, in um, England, it was a little bit more polished. Um, but Americans started to take the lead probably around 1850 when it came to um, actually producing the bindings. So the machines that they would use to go along with the bindings. Um, so the first folding machine was an American folding machine. The first um, book sewing machine was an American sewing machine. So things like that. Uh, but in, in terms of design, the English definitely had more refinement. Thanks. Um, the next question is from Erin Paulson. Can you tell us more about what you've learned about the women working in Bradley's factory? Unfortunately, I haven't learned much about the women working in Bradley's factory. I don't have any names for them at all. I don't know who they were. Uh, we don't really get um, any census information about Bradley's business until 1850, which was the first census of manufacturers. And at that time period, um, Bradley had a majority female um, workforce. And by 1860, his uh, workforce was 75% uh, female. So he had 90 women in 1850 and only 30 men. Wow. So I'd, I'd love to know more about the 1830s, Bradley. Um, and I'd love to know more about specific women. Uh, I just recently found out about a, a record book that has some names of women who are working in a bindery in Boston in the late 1850s, but um, I haven't had a chance to look at it with the pandemic yet. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know which bindery it is. It, it could possibly be Bradley's bindery, um, but it, it's, it's, it's hard to know at this point. We, we need a lot more study on, on, on female binders. And there'll be a, an article coming out um, next year on um, female labor in American bindries that I oh, wow. with with um, Dr. Elizabeth DeWolf from the University of New England. That's um, really exciting. In Biddeford. Yeah, we re really need to study this a lot more. They're so instrumental in terms of uh, bindries in America in the 19th century. Um, the next question comes from Lucas Dietrich. How quickly do other binders adopt case binding techniques? Does the practice spread very quickly or does it take time for others to learn and adopt? It actually seems to spread very quickly. How quickly, I don't know. It seems like it's, it starts being adopted in New York, maybe in 1831, 1832. Um, and then, you know, it, it spreads out from there. So it gets adopted more and more in New York, um, in Boston, in Philadelphia, although I see more adhered boards bindings in Philadelphia that are cloth covered. Um, so there, there does still seem to be a holdover on using that particular construction, but you had to compete. You know, these, these people were all competing and, and sometimes they were working for different bindaries and then moving to another bindery or setting up their own bindery. So um, there was a lot of copying going on, both stylistically in terms of the decoration of the books and in, in terms of, of how they were working. Okay. Um, hold on one second. So there's sort of two questions as, asking the same thing um, about the ordering the bindings based on the damage to the text block. Um, I think that sort of what what I what I'm thinking of when I see these two questions is, isn't it possible that the sheets were printed with damaged type and then cased in a binding that was made earlier? Does that make sense? 
Another well, they, person put it as, are you comfortable ordering the bindings on the order of printed sheets? I'm pretty comfortable on this because of how strong the demand was. So the second that they could get that book done, they could sell it. So they didn't want sheets laying around. They didn't want covers laying around. They wanted everything that they're doing. And this is the thing we always have to, to remember is they're businessmen. They're trying to make money. The publisher is, the printer is, the binder is. The quicker they can get something out the door when there's a demand for it, the faster they can make money. And they wanted to make money. And so as, as much demand as there was, they were putting this out as, as quickly as possible. So those sheets were not sitting around. You know, it wasn't a case where, oh, you could still find the book and sheets a, a year later, two years later, which did happen with, with books. Mm -hmm. um, this, they, you know, they were coming in the bindery and they were going out, you know, the next day, certainly by the end of the week, you okay. know, they're putting out 5,000 books. So I'm very comfortable with that. Um, sort of another question about like really trying to do things fast. This is from Shannon. Do you think all the different color cover, they use different covers because they were running multiple stamping machines. So if they were running multiple machines, they could do so simultaneously. That's a question I would love to be able to answer. I think I'm fairly comfortable with the idea that Bradley took his insurance money and he bought at least one stamping press. Um, how many he bought, I don't know. How long did it take him to get it because he would have to order it to be made? You know, stamping is first done in England in, in uh, the winter of 1832, I think February 1832, and so it has to make its way over to America. Um, and a machine has to be, to be built. So he might very well have purchased more than one and he could have used the two different things. What's clear to me is that the one stamp is the size of the book. And so it seems like he ordered that stamp for the book and maybe it wasn't ready when he started to bind, you know, the first few, um, or the first few hundred, the first few thousand, who knows? Um, I've only seen maybe 60 of these books, 65. Um, so it's, it's hard to really know from that small a number. Mm -hmm. But it appears that he got the, the die, the final die that's the size of the boards and started to use it before his name was in and then has the name cut in, which is a pretty simple thing to do because the die has a raised part that gets stamped down into the book. So to have your name raised up, all you have to do is cut your letters, your name into it. Mm. So he could have had someone do that in, in a day, but he stamped some before he had that done. Okay. And that's why we have these few copies that have no signature at all. Mm. Um, another question. So we have just three more. Um, do we know what Bradley's actual role in the bindery was? Was he doing bench work or managing? Again, that's another question I'd love to be able to answer. I think uh, initially, you know, when he first moves to Boston, he's doing a lot of bench work. By the time six months in a convent comes out, I, I don't know that he's doing any bench work at all. You know, he's got 40 employees and he's got to source materials. He's got a, you know, he's working with at least nine different publishers in 1835. So he's got to have those connections. You know, someone has to pay bills and, and get bills. Um, there's, there's just no correspondence that I've ever seen from that time period. I've seen correspondence from the 1840s mm -hmm. um, and the 1850s. The Concord Free Public Library in, in Massachusetts has some letters that he wrote to a gold beater. And so we get a little bit more of a sense of the personality of Bradley, which um, doesn't seem like it was very nice. I don't think he was a person I would have liked. Um, so he was probably a manager when six months came out and, you know, he might show people how to do something, but I don't think he was sitting there, you know, stamping a thousand cases each day. Okay. Um, I, I think he was running the bindery. Um, so then I'll just ask two more. What was the name of the Whitney, Whitney new firm after leaving Bradley? <sighs> I'm blanking on that right now. Um, 
I know that, but I'm just blanking on it. If it's you think funny. of it later, I'll put it in the description in the YouTube video. So yeah. hopefully by the um, time people are watching this later, it, you just scroll down and you'll see it there. I think it's Terry. Whitney and Terry is the new firm. And then I think it's by 1836 or 37, Whitney runs a dry goods store. He, he's completely out of the bookbinding business, which, you know, for him might have been a better thing. You know, the, it, it was not easy being a bookbinder. It was a lot of work. The, the margins were very close. Most of the time, the publishers dictated to you how much they would pay you for the binding. You didn't actually get to set your price so well. So there was a lot of squeezing on, on binders. Um, Bradley just happened to be very successful, you know, at that. Um, and so the last question is sort of a personal one. Are you hoping, hoping to continue collecting examples from collections? Um, yes, I, I, I have a, a problem. Um, <laughs> so I just purchased one recently. I haven't got it yet. Um, but I'm still looking for them. Um, and, you know, I'd love to learn more about ones that are in, um, in various collections. Uh, I, I find that, you know, it, it's much easier for me if I, if I buy one, than try to, you know, go some, somewhere to look at it, which is hard to do right now anyways. Yeah. Um, but when I have it, I can really kind of look at it and, when I'm in a reading room, of course, I follow all the guidelines of the reading room and I'm very careful with everything. Um, but there's more freedom in how you can compare when you have, you know, 40 copies yourself, you can lay them all out and look at them. And I'm still hoping to learn more from them. I mean, you know, I'll never know everything about this book, so. Well, thank you so much for a really, really interesting presentation today. It's been so nice to take such a deep dive on really just focused, looked at one book and one, one manufacturer. So, um, it's my thank pleasure. You again. And I hope everyone else has enjoyed themselves. We'll see you again next time. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.